We started our prayer series last week with an introductory lesson called Teach Me to Pray. And the point of that lesson was uh, based on what the disciples asked Jesus when he, they asked him to teach us to pray. And he responded with the so-called Lord's Prayer that we learned last week the Lord would never himself pray because it asked for forgiveness of sins and he wasn't a sinner. But it did inform his disciples how to pray. We took from that example, even though it's not talking about the sensation and not about the church today, we took from that the idea that people don't know how to pray normally. They just naturally don't. Um, they, they can pray to God, but we know that there may be a way God wants us to talk to him and a way to pray. And so the disciples asked to teach us to pray. We also know not what to pray for as we ought. Romans 8, 26 says that. And so we need to learn how to pray as well. Prayer is not something that should be left in its natural, raw state coming out of you. Uh, and that's because God's given us a book and he's revealed information about what he's doing. And that's progressively been uh, changing and revealed in the scripture. So our prayers need to be informed by what God has said and what he's doing. So today I want to talk about prayer perspective as we start to talk about how to pray and how to learn how to pray. I want to deal with how grace and how the understanding of God's grace dispensed today and given to us today changes our view on prayer. It wasn't all throughout history that, God, that men knew what God has done by his grace. It's not all throughout history that he has dispensed his grace. It wasn't from the beginning, as the covenant theologians will teach, the covenant of grace, they say, begins at the fall. Well, no, nobody knew about God's grace except that he did give them animal skins to cover themselves, and uh, he did give them the mercy of staying alive uh, so that they can multiply. But uh, the dispensation of God's grace was given to and through the Apostle Paul, Amen. who was the last apostle to see Jesus Christ risen from the dead, and the last one to, uh, to inspire scriptures that are recorded in the Bible that you have sitting in front of you. And so since grace was not understood, known, or performed throughout all of history, then you might expect that our prayers and our response to God may be a little different than how people did before. And so this is how our understanding of the Bible rightly divided affects prayer. It's normal, as we learned last week, not to know how to pray. So if that's where you're at, that's a fine place. You can simply pray, Lord, teach me to pray. And that'll be a nice prayer as you try to learn how to do that. So it's normal not to know how to pray. It's normal also for your prayers to be saturated with requests. That's also normal. Because recognizing that you're praying to God, God being the supposed benevolent, omnipotent creator of all things, and here I am, this peon of a person who has many inadequacies, I'm going to ask him for lots of help. And so this is just natural for your prayer to be saturated with requests. And so often people will describe prayers, well, how do I talk to God? I don't know. Well, just say what's on your mind. That gets dangerous, <laughs> especially when you don't have much on your mind that is rightly discerned from Scripture. And so praying what's on your mind, well, that, that includes worries that you have every day. Uh, it includes cares that you have every day, needs that you might have every day. It includes your plans for your life that are really just immediately in your history here. It includes your frustrations and your griefs. These are what's on people's minds, generally speaking, when it comes to prayer to God. They want his help. Okay. If their plan is working out, then they don't need God's help. But when it's frustrated and when they have a grief, when something they can't handle on their own, they ask for God's help and make those requests. So this is the normal state of things. This is the normal state of prayers throughout most of the scripture, not being informed by the revelation of God's grace that we have today, the benefit of having today. We're even taught by popular hymns to take it to the Lord in prayer, uh, from the, which is a phrase in hymnals, but not in the Bible. Anybody heard the phrase, take it to the Lord in prayer? Or what a friend we have in Jesus, right? Those two statements are not in the Bible anywhere. I have to say that because the, the, the hymn is so popular that people often confuse what they sing with Scripture, which is why we're very careful in our hymnal to edit the words so that they either align with Scripture or are teaching doctrinally correct things. Because people remember songs a lot easier than they remember what I'll say this morning or even the Bible. But we're taught in hymns to take it to the Lord in prayer. In fact, the lyrics of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, familiar with this song? What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So there's the griefs and sins you're taking to him in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And so are you heavy laden? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, do your friends forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. So that you sing it over and over again. 
over the last century and a half, take the Lord in prayer. And so this informs people's ideas of how they should pray. Well, I'm going to pray any trouble, tribulation, grief, worry that I have, I'm going to take it to the Lord. And what exactly? What do we expect God to do? Well, he's the omnipotent one. Fix it. Right? He's going to fix it for me. He's going to answer my prayers. There's actually two ways. One reason why the, the hymn is not in our hymnal right now is because the lyrics are so ambiguous. Uh, we don't quite know whether the, the lyrics are talking about the work that Christ did on the cross and taking your griefs and sorrows and sins there, or whether it's just talking about the griefs and sorrows you have ignorant of the cross and thinking God's just simply going to intervene in history to change it. It's simply unclear. And because of that, people tend to think that the latter. I'm going to pray a prayer, and God will answer my request in my life, in, in my immediate context here. Even the Bible, however, in Philippians 4, verse 6, Paul tells us to be careful for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, make your requests made known unto God. So we saw that last week. Even Paul instructs us to make requests to God. But what tends to happen is that this all we know how to pray is requesting things of God, is that prayer turns into like a room service request. We think, well, this is God's hotel that we're all living in. We all have a special room, and God is the butler, right? He's the one that we say, hey, the TV's not working, God. Fix it. Uh, you know, my bed's a little lumpy, God. The hot water's not working. You know, can I have something to eat today? And we expect him to answer our call. And when he doesn't answer the call, what do we do? Bad review, right? God's not doing his job. That's the concept people have about prayer requesting with God, generally, without being that frank about it, or it turns into a suggestion box. Uh, God, I uh, have this kind of suggestion for how life isn't going quite well for me, and so I pray this to make it easier and better for me, or to, to make things work out, um, as if God doesn't have his own will and agenda, like we're going to suggest to him as if you could counsel the Lord and what he should do. Or a complaint hotline. I don't like what's going on here, submitting a complaint, kind of like on the back of those trucks, you know, call here, how's my driving? And people would like pray to God and they say, well, you're not driving too well, God. You know, we don't like how you're doing. There's lots of tragedies, a lot of th bad things going on, uh, a lot of things affecting me. And so please keep me from these things is my complaint. And so that's what prayer turns into. And so people have things like prayer lists, right? Like we talk about prayer, especially in groups. People gather together when you ask each other, what can I pray for you about? What needs do you have? And thus becomes the litany of complaints, griefs, sorrows, and requests that we all need to take to God in prayer. And we do that for one another. And we pray to God for these requests. Some requests are left unspoken. You know, the, the secret silent requests people make. And uh, we make lists even. The most devout of us will make a list of those requests and go through that list through our prayers, right? Requesting for everyone and what the things that they need. Paul tells us to make requests, right? Uh, what we're talking about this morning is perhaps our perspective on prayer needs to change according to what God has already done if all we're doing is making requests, we're no different than those who did not have the scripture, who did not know what God has been doing. All right. So the feedback on prayer with this, this suggestion box, the group prayers, the prayer list is they go over and over again their prayers. And uh, a common complaint, if people are being honest, is that prayer doesn't work. Right? We've been making tons of requests and they never get heard. Right? Uh, it doesn't work. Or I've tried that right? and it, it doesn't help. Or I don't see how it helps. And so people tend to stop praying or not believing in God because of their, their, their natural way of thinking about prayer that's not informed what God has done. God can't be a loving God. We've made a thousand requests to him to stop the evil and suffering in this world. He has not responded to it. And so there's the complaint, right? And in their ignorance, they stop believing in God, uh, not being informed on what God himself has said and done in the scripture, okay? And so prayer can frustrate people quite a lot. Maybe it's frustrated you as you've tried to pray and fail and you know, limited success, uh, particularly when your request isn't granted, is where the frustration comes from, is when God does not answer your prayer. And so what happens usually with lessons about prayer uh, in the church or with books on prayer, which abound, as we talked about last week, is that learning to pray then becomes an exercise in how to get what you ask for. That's the exercise. So unanswered prayer is the thing we're trying to eliminate. That's the disease and the cancer among Christian prayer. We're trying to eliminate unanswered prayer. And if you try to recognize the truth that a lot of prayers go unanswered, then you are the one adding doubt and skepticism to Christianity. You get removed. The rest of us are going to believe that God answers every prayer, and we're going to teach you how to get what you ask for. This is usually what happens, okay? And so people are taught to beg for God. Make sure you ask frequently. 
Just, I mean, just don't leave it alone. Just, you know, hit him again and again and again. Remember the parable of the unjust judge? And, you know, they kept coming back. And even the world, if you bother them enough, squeaky wheel principle, right? Just be a squeaky wheel with God. Now, preachers don't say that, but that's what they're teaching. Generally speaking, they're teaching repetitive prayers, and uh, God will pay attention. Uh, there is actually an opposite teaching to that, which is you should have enough faith to say it once and never again. You ever heard that one? It's like if you say it over and over again, you're not trusting God's actually going to hear you. So just say it once and be done. Your prayers get real short after that <laughs> if you only pray things once. Or pray big. Your prayer requests are too small, and God is a big God. He doesn't want to bother himself with small requests. He handles the big ones. So, and yeah, I've not heard anyone try to pray for the elimination of world hunger, you know, or, or world peace or something like that, except for Miss America. Uh, but <laughs> pray big is the suggestion. Or pray in groups, right? Or, or, or maybe find a righteous man. James 5.16 says in the Bible that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man Avails much, right? So find a holy person, someone more righteous than you. That way, if they can pray the prayer with you or for you, then maybe their prayers get through, right? I mean, I, I filed some complaints. I mean, prayers and some suggestions. I mean, prayers. But that guy, maybe you got to listen to him, right? Thus, you find the pastor. And I'm getting requests. You know, Justin, pray for this and that. I, think, why? I don't even know you. Why, why am I doing this? Well, I'm the preacher, apparently. I am the righteous man that avails much. And I'm not. None of us are righteous. But that's the idea. Do we need to pray in groups? Prayer warriors. You ever heard that? Prayer warriors. Nothing wrong with praying, right? But the idea that if we get enough people praying together, then we get like a mega mind of prayer going on, and this somehow has a greater force to get through the clouds so that God can hear and finally answer. It's not like a White House petition, right, where God's like, okay, what's your question I feel today? We got 10,000 people praying for that and 5,000 praying for that. So who's going to win the Super Bowl? I don't know. <laughs> That's not how God deals with prayers by the number of people who pray them. It's not that, well, you need to do church things, get your prayers answered. To get what you ask for, you just got to do the church things that God says to do, and then you do them, and then he'll answer your prayers. Right? This is generally, though, what, what, what is said. Now, in the Scripture, most of the Bible was written, was describing a time in which God had not yet revealed himself in Christ or the dispensation of the grace of God. Another way to say that is that much of the Bible... It was not yet revealed how God could save people or the multitude of blessings that we have by his grace. Most of the Bible is, doesn't have that in it. It's yet to be revealed. And so we read prayers from David all through the Psalms. No one speaks more about prayer than Paul except for David. And that's because he wrote Psalms that were his prayers. And David prayers often a prayer like this. Hear my prayer, O God. Hear my prayer. In fact, in Psalm 54, he says, Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. That's an interesting thought. As we'll talk today about how grace changes our prayer perspective, read how the prayer perspective was from David before he understood God's grace, before he never did, but before his grace was revealed. He would pray, God, give ear to the words of my mouth. We have a little different approach to that, I think, which is that we have a book which are the words of God's mouth, and we need to give ear to it. Amen. That's an in perspective. David yet didn't have the whole Bible. He didn't have it, the scripture. He was partly writing it through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And so he says, God, hear my prayer, which is to say, I'm trying to say things, and I want my prayers to get answered. I'm trying to get what I ask for. Hear me, O God. He says, judge me according to my righteousness. Right? He says in Psalm 54, he says, save me. That's part of his prayer. Save me, God. Right? We'll deal with later whether or not you should pray that prayer or not, if God's grace has been revealed. And so we have David's example of prayer. In Psalm 143, verse 1, he says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications, in thy faithfulness answer me, and in my righteousness. The only time in the Bible that ever speaks about God answering prayer is David's plea for God to answer his prayer and his faithfulness. Okay, nowhere else does the Bible say that God answers, using that language, answers prayer. All right, and yet he has responded to people's prayers. He has answered prayers before. <clears throat> a survey on the National Day of Prayer last year found that 87% of Americans say that one or more prayers have been answered in the past 12 months. I don't know what that means. It's kind of like, that's worse than saying my football team won one game last season, right? I mean, you've, pray, you've played more than 16 prayers, haven't you? And yet, anyway, that's supposed to be a positive thing. 87% of people say one or more prayers have been answered in the last, month, uh, last uh, 12 years, or 12 months, excuse me. 
and that 84% of Americans say that God hears prayers no matter what you believe. What's well, interesting, because as we hear David saying, hear my prayer, O God, a lot of humanity, a lot of religions, a lot of people in the scripture, that was the approach to prayer, is that God can do things we cannot, we're requesting, and God, we're trying to get God to hear us and to, to respond to what we request and get what we ask. The Bible, however, says that God does not hear some prayers, not because he can't, uh, not because he, he doesn't have the ability, uh, but for other reasons. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You wives are going to love this verse, though Peter is the apostle to, to the circumcision. But 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands. We won't deal with verse 6. Women, you've studied that one, haven't you? Calling your husband Lord. Verse 7, likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as of the weaker vessel, and as being, uh, the what? We won't deal with that right now. As being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Hindered, you see this? If, they, if the husbands don't give honor to the wife, their prayers get what? They hindered. Wow. So there we have it. If we're trying to get our prayers answered, maybe we should treat our wives right. That's kind of what the verse is saying, isn't it? Of course, Peter's not your apostle, and Peter wasn't given the dispensation of the grace of God. He's not informed with how God is responding or not to prayers today. He knows how God was responding to prayers when Jesus said it in his earthly ministry and the Holy Ghost of Pentecost. Look at 1 Peter 3, verse 12. It says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Does that sound like God's giving grace to a world of sinners? That sounds like he's only giving ears and attention to the righteous ones and not giving. In fact, he says he's against the evil ones. That verse there, by the way, if you're thinking about the Bible rightly divided, shows you that Peter is not teaching the station of the grace of God. That's right. Nowhere does Paul say that the Lord is against the evil in this dispensation. He's showing grace to all today. And it's not that Peter was wrong when he said this. He was right when he said it. It's wrong to take what Peter said and describe what God's doing now. There was further revelation from what Peter knew. Amen. Under Israel's covenant program where God chose a nation and gave them a covenant and laws and gave them instructions to do, and if they did them, they were declared righteous, then God would be hearing the prayers of the righteous. And those who disobeyed his commands, according to the covenant, God would not hear their prayers or grant them. The question is, are you a people under Israel's covenants or not? Well, now we're doing dispensational Bible study again. This is, this is twice now, two weeks in a row, where our dispensational Bible study can affect our prayer. Right? I think there's going to be a connection here in this series. You understanding what God is doing affects what you should do in your prayers and what you should say. Jeremiah 7, 16 is, of course, is Old Testament, but it's interesting just to see that there's times in the Bible where God even tells people, don't bother praying for that. People want to get their prayers answered. They want to find a secret key to manipulate God, to give them what they ask. They want to know why their phone line is broken, and why can't I ask God and get? Right. Jeremiah 7, verse 16. God says, Pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear them. If Jeremiah 7, 16 is talking to you, which it's not, by the way, but if it is, then we got to know who these people are that God says, I will not hear them. You can cry as much as you want, not listening. That sounds like a parent and a child a little bit. Because I've said that to my son. You can cry as much as you want. I'm not going to hear that. I'm not going to give you what you want when you're crying at me, right? Or disobeying. That's what God says in Jeremiah 7, 16. Under Israel's covenants, he says to Israel, I will not hear. Do not pray for these people. They're going to get punished, yeah. right? God's will has been declared in Jeremiah 7 of punishment and destruction, and he cannot be deterred from it at that moment. He's not dispensing grace there, is he? No. He's not dispensing grace when he says, don't pray to me. I'm not going to hear. I'm going to judge you. Look at Micah 3, verse 4. Similar thing, where Micah 3 talks about God not hearing prayers because of disobedience. Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. So you get the idea here where people will soak up the teaching that I guess to get my prayers answered, I need to behave. If I behave, the, the child is rule, right? When you behave, you'll get what you ask for. That's me and God. 
I behave, I do the church things, I, I don't do wrong, you know, and then he gives me what I want. That's a very childish way of thinking your relationship with God, and it's not describing your relationship to him now, but uh, that is what God said in Micah 3 verse 4, that because your disobedience, particularly to their covenant that he had with God, you will not get any prayers answered. Your heavens will be like brass, like the Deuteronomy says, and your prayers won't get through the clouds to reach God. Look at James 1, verse 6 and 7. There's another reason here that prayers might not get answered, that God says, I won't hear prayers. James, of course, is speaking to the 12 tribes of Israel. Are you seeing a theme here? The passages in the Bible that talk about your prayers being hindered or not based on your behavior and actions are in passages talking about Israel under their covenants. But James 1, verse 6 says, Let him ask in faith, not nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So when you ask, and you're not fully confident that when you ask, God's going to give. If you don't fully believe that what you ask, God will receive, you will receive from God, then you're not going to get anything. And thus the preaching of when you ask, don't ask doubting. You need to ask believing. But that's why I said earlier, if you're going to raise the doubt in people's minds, they're going to kick you out of the prayer group because we need to pray with full confidence that what we ask, God will give, even if we don't see it, right? This is where Pentecostals get off the ropes. Well, they'll claim things that they actually don't see because they're afraid of verses like this, that if they have any expression of doubt, they'll not get it at all. So I'm going to claim a healing this morning. I'm totally healed. I have no sickness within me. Why? Well, you, can, you might see, well, Justin, you're feeling kind of ill. I'm going to claim being healed. If I have any doubt, it won't happen. Kind of a weird logic there, but James 1, 6 and 7 talks about asking God for wisdom, by the way. Not all the other things, but for wisdom. And says you need to believe that he can give it to you. Right? So there's another reason, another place where prayers may not get answered. Right? I say all this because people tend to think that God, what a friend we have in Jesus. He's going to answer every prayer that we make. Billy Graham uh, was popularly perhaps a joke, saying that the only place his prayers are never answered is on the golf course. That's what Billy Graham said. It's like, wow, Billy. And he's trying to communicate the idea that God answers prayers, and he's going to answer your prayers, and let's not deal with the unanswered prayers. You're not, there's something issue with your life, sins or something that's prohibiting it. All right. But there's some prayers about what God doesn't answer. Jesus even said in Luke 11, so there are prayers that God says don't bother praying. There are prayers that he says in the Bible he won't listen to depending on the conditions and your behavior. And then Jesus comes along in Luke 11, and he adds this to the mix. Luke 11, verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. That's it? I just got to ask, because we've been doing that for a while. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks us, who? Everyone that asks, receives. I don't know if that's observably true, Jesus. What in the world is he saying? He that seeks finds, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now, 87% of people say they've had one or more prayers answered in the last year. Jesus says, knock and you'll, you'll, you'll get it. The door open. Ask and you'll receive. Something doesn't line up. How is Jesus giving us blank check to ask and you're going to get? And then people ask all the time and they don't get. Right? Why is that? That's kind of adding confusion to it here. Matthew 21, verse 22. Could it be that Jesus is speaking to a certain people in a certain context and isn't talking about how he operates in this dispensation? Well, that's a fact, but most people don't recognize that. They think what Jesus said here in the red letters is how he's operating today. By the way, if that's true, you should sell all your possessions and go to Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Ghost. You say, that already happened. Well, then, <laughs> things have changed, haven't they? Amen. Matthew 21 and verse 22. He says, all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, notice the word, believing, you shall receive. That's James 1, 6 and 7, right? So Jesus adds this and says, ask which be given to you. If you simply believe, you'll receive. Um, it might help you in Luke, if you go back to Luke chapter uh, 11, that the thing that he tells them to ask for is the Holy Ghost. And he's saying there, if you ask for the Holy Ghost, I will give it, because that's what he's going to do. And he did it at Pentecost. There's certain things that they could ask for. When they ask, they'll get he is not saying, ask for whatever is on your mind. He says, ask these things and I will give those things to you is what's going on. But that's another lesson for another day. But if Jesus said, ask and it be given to you, how can this be true for you when Paul said to the Romans, to the Gentiles, that we don't know what to pray for? Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Paul says, you don't know what to pray for as you ought. 
So now we, now we have conflicting things, because one says ask and I'll receive, the other says I don't know what to ask for. Well, which is it? Do I already have in my mind, in the infirmities of my flesh, exactly what I should ask for and exactly what God's going to give me? Or do I need to learn something about what God is actually doing? Okay, the latter is going to be true. So this, this creates this confusion about answered prayers that is a, a continual problem for the church. How to pray, how to get what we ask for, how to solve the unanswered prayer problem. What is God actually doing? Like, is he consistent at all? You know, he answered that guy's prayer because he prayed big, but I tried to pray big, it didn't work, right? And he answered that guy's prayer before he even asked. And, and I asked multiple times, it didn't work, right? So what is God doing? How do I know the right buttons to push? What secret word do I tell the room service operator to get actually what I want? What is the secret? Is he going to help at all? Does he actually care? Am I doing it wrong? And what kind of friend is Jesus if he does everything we demand? I mean, request. What kind of friend does that? Like, do you have any friends like that? You say, well, no, but they're not Jesus. But if you actually had a person that everything you asked them, they did, what would that tell you? Like, why are you doing everything I ask you to do? You'd get real puffed up real quick, wouldn't you? Like, are, are, you are you my slave? Like, you have no opinion of your own? You have no discernment? Or is everything I ask you proper for you to give me? Are you an enabler? <laughs> Like, just give me another beer. Okay. <laughs> Are you an enabler? What kind of friend is it that gives you everything you ask? Right? Maybe we need to learn something about what Jesus said in Matthew 21 or how we should pray as we ought. Why is getting our prayers answered the actual goal of prayer? Yeah, that's a question you never considered. Of course getting what we want is what prayer is for. What if it's not? What if your prayers getting answered and everything on your list going down to zero because God answered the whole thing on your list, what if that's not the goal of prayer? What if the natural way you pray to a God who has all power and you who have little is to ask, ask, ask? What if that perspective needs to change? You say, based on what? Based on the information God has revealed in the scripture. Based on the grace that God has given you. Right? He's given a dispensed grace before you were even born. You need to learn something about what God has done before you go asking God to do something. Because maybe... He's already done something, right? And you have to be acknowledgeable about that. And when your perspective changes, when your mind changes about what God has done, it will change your prayers. Amen. When God speaks, it should change your perspective on a lot of things. And Hebrews 1, 1 says God has spoken, right? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says in sundry times and in diverse manners, God spake in time past unto the fathers, by the way, by the prophets, this is why in time past, when people want to talk to God directly, they'd go to the priest or go to the prophet. And prophets even say, talk to me and I'll tell God and I'll come back and tell you what he said. That's the point of a prophet, right? Not everyone can speak to God. And so another reason why Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. He's talking about the fact that any of you could pray to me. That's a different avenue than just, I need to go find a prophet and a priest. That's a different thing. So he's talking about everyone who asks me will get, not that you'll get whatever you want. That's a different way of thinking. But God speaks, and when he speaks in Scripture, it changes our perspective. God has spoken. This book, what God has said, should change what you think about yourself and in the world, Amen. and thus God and how you pray to him. In the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, which is the, was the second most popular book next to the King James Bible back in the 1600s, because it informed people's questions about the Christian religion back in the day, they define prayer in the catechism. What is prayer? And they define it as, in the beginning here, Christian prayer is response to God. Oh, that's very interesting. Christian prayer is response to God. Because people pray, and they're looking for God to answer them. They're looking for God to respond to them. I am making the request. God should respond. And then the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, if it's been around for hundreds of years, says Christian prayer is response to God. Response to what? To what he said. To what God has done. You see, Christian, which means those who are in Christ now, not David, who was never a Christian because Christ hadn't come yet, right? Neither the 12 apostles when Christ died because he hadn't died yet, right? There was a time when Christ wasn't around. Christian prayer, which is those that are in Christ in the body of Christ, is a response to God. Amen. When you think of it that way, when you change that perspective, you're no longer looking for God to answer you. You're the one answering God, right? We saw answering God, what did he say? Ah, now you're on the right track. What did he do? Yes, now you're on the right place. 
to find out what God said and what God did. Job couldn't be on that track. David couldn't be on that track. David couldn't pray as a Christian because Christ hadn't come, right? He was looking for God to intervene because God said, here's a covenant contract I have with you, and if you do this, then I will give. And if you don't do this, I will not give. So David prayed according to that and said, I'm done, your turn, right? You don't have that contract. You have a Bible, however, Amen. that gives you grace, that has the information of God's grace in it. So when Job prayed, we covered Job a little bit last week. When Job, who was living in a time before the Bible, most of the Bible was written at all, he didn't have a Bible. Remember last year, he asked that, he wished that God had written a book. Job said, I wish God had written a book, then I know what he's doing. You and I have a book. We have the book of Job and among other books that to know what God's doing, and we still ignore it. But Job's prayer of why, why are you doing this, God? Just tell me why. Many Christians are right there in their prayers, right? That things are happening to me, I don't know why, God, just tell me why. I'm done asking you to fix it, because you're not doing that. Just tell me why, right? And Christians are there. But praying that prayer now would be to not listen to what God has said. God has told us why in this book, right? So we have, our perspective needs to be, I need to find out what God has said before I can intelligently respond to it, right? This, this should be your perspective on prayer. Our perspective should change in the fact that we are praying to our creator, the life giver, the savior, not a divine butler. It's not incumbent upon him. It's not, he's not obligated to answer anything you request of him. And that doesn't make him less loving or less omnipotent or less gracious, by the way. He's given you life. He's given you salvation. He's given you existence. And that with his love and peace and grace and everything else. <clears throat> and so since he is that, we, we read in 1 Timothy, Paul, among others in the scripture, des described God in terms like this. <clears throat> And by the way, most, a lot of times when Paul does this and he goes on this description of God to praise God for who he is, uh, it, it usually follows what God has done. It's very interesting. So knowing what God is, is doing, what he's done, actually helps you recognize the goodness of God. So again, another reason why people doubt God's goodness, they really don't know what he's done. How do you know someone's good? Unless you see what they've done, right? And so if I'm trying to get you to believe that, you know, Joe Butler down the road is a really good guy, just every week say, please, you know, worship Joe Butler, or at least praise him for how good he is. I mean, after a while, you're going to be, um, what did he do that was so good? Why is he so good? I've never seen him or what he did. You have to know what someone does in order to praise them. First Timothy 1, verse 17, Paul says, Unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And he ends his prayer. Amen. Right? It's a praise about God is what this is here. And it comes on the coattails of Paul saying that he saved me, Paul, and you and me, by his grace, as a pattern of those who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He has given everlasting life, right? Immortality to light through the gospel. Immortality was inaccessible until Christ brought to light and explained how you can have it as a sinner. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. It says which in his times, Jesus Christ, in his times, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only have immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, which no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. That's who you're praying to. That should change your perspective. Okay. The word potentate is not something you use very often. It, it is actually used in the, the vow you take when you naturalize as a citizen in America, that you'll have no other potentate. And my wife and I really deliberated about that for a while. We said, wait a minute. We have a potent date <laughs> that's higher than the American government, Amen. right? Um, of course, they weren't meaning it in that context. But yeah, the verse is right there. He's the only potent date, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Christians got killed over stuff like that in the past. We're still alive. So, you know, anyway. Just knowing who you're praying to changes your perspective on, on maybe how you pray. You know, since he's not answering uh, my room service request, then, you know, give a, smile, a frowny face to God on his, on his feedback review. That's not how we should think about it. Instead of God being the one that serves you and he created the hotel and you're complaining about what's wrong with it, it's more like God gave you the keys to a new house. And as he walks away, you're going, hey, can I have some more? He just gave you a whole house. And can I have a toaster too? It's like, go buy a toaster. You just got a new house. 
Like, th th this is what really God has done, is given you a gift that you could not afford. Amen. And you're asking him for things, many of which you can, and then other things that are not informed. He's like, open the door, you'll see a toaster's right there. And we don't want to do that. And we haven't entered the house yet. We're just, can I have something else? That's where we're at. Our perspective needs to change on prayer. And that's the right place to be. Some prayers don't require an answer at all. I'm trying to change our perspective on the only point of prayer is getting our prayers answered and requests granted. Is that some prayers don't require an answer at all. Consider prayers of thanks. When someone gives you a new house, a proper response might be, thank you, thank you so much, thank you, how can I ever repay you, thank you again. Maybe call them up the next week, thank you for the new house that I'm living in. Right, that might be a proper response, a little bit. And that doesn't require any answer request. Well, now that he's thanked me, I've got to buy him a bunch of flowers. You know, no, it's nothing, nothing like that. There's no obligation like that from God to respond to Thanksgiving prayers or prayers of praise. God, you're so good and gracious and wise for what you've accomplished and done for me and everyone else. That doesn't require an answer. Or prayers of reflection, right, about what God is doing or who you are. And God, I just mess up all the time. Add some thanks to that. Thank you for your grace. Right? Not asking for nothing in that prayer. Lots of prayers you can pray that are of thanks and praise and reflection that don't require God's answer at all. So if your perspective on prayer is simply to get what you ask for, then your perspective on prayer needs to change. I mean, a little more broadened than just that. And by the way, most requests do not get answered. Even in the Bible, even under the covenants that when David was praying according to the covenants, most prayers don't get answered. And that's a good thing, by the way. If everyone's prayer got answered and we were the ones running things by our prayers, it would be terrible. Yeah. Right? You don't know what's good for me. I don't know what's good for the neighbor down the road. My prayers can really mess things up. What I really want God is a road to come right to the church building, right there. You don't have to turn around the corners. Everybody's house gets plowed over, you know. We can really mess things up. Most prayer requests don't get answered, and that's a good thing because God is good. And so he goes, yep, not doing that. Not doing that. Nope. James 4, verse 3. Even James, under Israel's covenants, writing to Israel, when he said, ask, and if you believe, you'll get. James even says, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. What's that? The things that you want. Yeah. Oh, so I can't just ask whatever I want. No, you can't, even under the covenant. So when Jesus says, ask and receive, it's not like, what's on my mind? What do I want today? What do I need today? What are my griefs? God's here to solve those. Nope, right? You're asking wrongly is what that is. And when you do that, you're not going to get it in any dispensation. Okay, yeah, that's a good thing because God is good. We got to consider, too, that now that we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God, grace informs us of some things. The number one thing that grace informs us of, the first thing it informs us of, is that we are sinners that cannot save ourselves. That's what grace Amen. teaches us. Okay? Grace is not something you receive by performing some work. It's not, I get grace through eating the cracker, or get grace by being water baptized, or get grace by coming to church. You receive grace, which is defined as the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, because you couldn't do that work on your own behalf. Because you could not save yourself. That's what God's grace is. Something you don't deserve and cannot perform to earn. And what grace teaches you is that you simply could not do it. Right? You could not be righteous on your own. You couldn't if you tried to justify yourself. You wouldn't be. Some people recognize that. Other people do not. The people who normally do not attend churches. <laughs> the people who do recognize that think they're not good enough to go to church or they don't need God. Right? But the truth is none of us are righteous. And grace teaches us that. Grace being dispensed says that none of you can do it on your own, so I had to do it for you because you're all a bunch of sinners. Amen. Now, a lot of you are like, well, yeah, I knew that all along. But there are people, particularly religious people in the past, that did not know that. Jews, particularly, who in a long time ago when Paul was writing, were given God's covenants and the adoption and the glory and the kingdom and the Messiah came to them and everything else. And so there were some Jews who were kind of like, yeah, we're God's people and none of you are. And so Paul says, not anymore. Now that God's changing some things, even Jesus came and said, you guys are kind of puffed up about this. Even Paul wrote, after Jesus revealed the mystery to him, that there's no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ, and there's none righteous. When Paul writes that, he's looking at the Jews, going, there's none righteous. Jew and Gentile, they're all sinners. They've all come short of the glory of God. He says, by the deeds of the law, who's given the law? Israel was given the law. By these of the law shall no, no flesh be justified. 
There's no works that can justify you. And so what we learn from grace is that we needed God's help, but that means we're all sinners. In Romans chapter 1, which talks about how we came to be sinners and describes in 25 words something that in there somewhere should apply to you. It applies to me too. 25 words uh, describing sin in the last four or five verses of that chapter. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, Romans 1, 28. To do those things which are not convenient. Because they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. They rejected him, and so God gave them up to do what they thought was best, which was sin. And he describes it as being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, but it goes on and on, just describing the human sinful condition. Okay? Before you were saved, before I was saved, we were reprobate in our mind. If you can't Understand that, then you got to go back to how you got saved. Because salvation is from this sin. The reprobate mind, the mind that did not want God in their knowledge, did not want God's help, thought that they were above God, that's reprobate. You can be saved from reprobate mind if you trust the gospel by God's grace. But that's what we were. What we needed was a change of mind. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, without Christ, we're reprobates. We're lost to sin. Okay, Ephesians 4.18 says the Gentiles and those who are lost, those who are unsaved, have their minds darkened. They, they can think. they got minds, just like you and I have minds. But they're darkened to the truth, the reality of what is right and what is wrong, according to God, what is, what is sin and righteousness. Okay, he's given us a conscience. That's as far as it goes. Ephesians 4.18, they're darkened in their mind, and they work all lasciviousness into greediness is what Ephesians 4.18 says. Greediness. When left to their own devices without God, what tends to happen is people just get whatever they want. That's, greedy. That's what greed is called. Getting whatever I want. Selfish. Right? The opposite of that would be charitable towards someone else. But it's greedy to get whatever they want. Whatever their flesh gets. Whatever benefits them. Right? This is actually, ironically, the principle that social Darwinism operates on. It's like, well, how do these things exist in society? Well, because we just do what's best for society. Like, what's best for us? But it's, it's kind of like greed institutionalized, right? But that's another story for another day. Before we were saved, our minds were reprobate. They were vain. They were greedy. And so if they were praying, if we were praying, and you might have prayed before you were saved. People can pray before they're saved. Whether God's going to answer the prayer is another story. But, or afterward, by the way. But when you pray and your mind is reprobate, vain, and greedy, what do your prayers sound like? Much like people who are saved who don't know how to pray. Right? Reprobate, vain, and greedy. Because your mind hasn't changed yet. You trusted the gospel. So you have something to be thankful for. Amen. And maybe you still try to pray the way you've always prayed. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give right? Vain and greedy. Not knowing God's will. You have to learn how to pray, which means you have to learn what God's done. You have to learn what God said. And that might take some time. Amen. It's a good thing, as we learned last week, that if you don't know how to pray or are praying wrongly, you should still pray. Because... If you're saved and you have the Spirit dwelling in you, not knowing how to pray, the Spirit makes intercession for you. So, I mean, that helps that you're saved by grace. It's, it's, when you're saved by grace, that doesn't save you from your past sins. It saves you from your sins now, right? So your inability to pray right, forgiven, <laughs> saved from that. Thank God for that. And then we go on to learn about it, how to pray. What we, what we don't need is a change in our situation. Usually our prayer requests have to do with that. Change our situation, give me what I need so I don't feel so afflicted, right? Change my situation. But what if we don't need to change the situation? What if God wills is a change of your mind? What God is intending to do with you, to change your mind from the inside out. In fact, that was the problem that led them to a reprobate mind, Romans 1, 21. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of God. Their minds is where it started. They stopped giving glory to God, and they stopped thanking God, and thus they became vain in their imaginations, their thoughts, their prayers, their actions. And they became fools, lacking the wisdom that only God gives, the knowledge of God gives. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so we have a, a need for a change of minds. What if we don't need a request to every prayer you give, but what you need is actually what God has given? 
It's a change of perspective, you see. We are soldiers, by the way. That is what the Bible describes you who are saved. Amen. You're soldiers of Christ, even though you may not know how to fight. That's the position you've been given. You need to learn how to fight, spiritually speaking. Um, we are servants. That's what the Bible describes you who are saved, servants of the Lord, um, which some people might think is a downgrade, but actually it's an upgrade because the one you were serving before was a lot lower than the Lord. That was yourself. Right? Serving one higher actually is a promotion. Right? So you're a servant of the Lord. You're a steward of God's mysteries, of his revelation. 1 Corinthians 4.1, right? You're stewards of the mysteries. It's required of stewards to be faithful. Um, you are in prayer speaking to the general as a foot soldier. As in prayer, you're speaking to the Lord and you're the servant, right? That's the perspective. It's not to the butler who's here to serve us. It's to the Lord whom we serve. Amen. That's the change of perspective, which means that we're not setting the agenda by our prayers. We're not the ones saying, Lord is letting you know, you need to change what you're doing because where I'm sitting, it doesn't look good. Well, the general doesn't, the general hears what the foot soldiers say, but he sees the big picture, right? He's like, doesn't look good there? What's that soldier say? Looks okay there? Doesn't look good there? Okay. And he's setting the plan. And more particularly, he's already purposed a plan Amen. that you're a part of. Yeah. And so, again, the thinking in your prayers that I'm going to control what God is doing because I have a good outlook on how he should operate, even though you're too close to the situation to see any different, right? We gotta recognize your perspective. You have a job to do, but your job is not to call the shots and set the agenda and set God's purpose. Amen. And yet we have requests. We need to learn to change our perspective. Look at Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Philippians 4 verse 6 is the prayer verse that we plucked out of context earlier that we should be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer uh, and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. The instruction to request of God that which you need to request, not be full of care of it, not to let the, the need affect you, right? Look what verse 7 says, however. And God will answer anything you ask. That's not in your translation, right? No, no. It says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The response to your request making to God is that your mind is kept on Christ. That's the response to prayer. And not only that, this is verse 6 to 7 in the chapter. There's actually seven things listed in Philippians 4, 1 through 8 that it's instructed for you to do. Not just prayer requests. Verse 1 says, stand fast in the Lord. Verse 2 says, be of the same mind in the Lord. Verse 3 says, help each other with the gospel in the Lord. Verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. Verse 5 says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Accept your prayer requests. Moderation be known unto all men. Verse 6, then it says, pray, make your requests known unto God. And then it says, the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds. Then in verse 8, it says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true or honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure or lovely or good report or virtue, if, any there, if there be any praise, think on these things. If you change what you think, it might change your prayers as well, Amen. right? And so there's actually seven things in that chapter that we should be doing and not taking verse six before we take the others and making any request without standing in the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord and helping and labor to the Lord, right? Look at Philippians 4 verse 11, or verse 13 rather. You know this verse, Philippians 4 13. I'm sure you have it on a bookmark somewhere at home some book in your library, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, I can still remember where my perspective changed on this verse. Can you? Maybe it never has changed. I don't know. I remember reading this verse thinking it was about self-empowerment. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Right? So God's helping me do things. That's what I thought it was the first time I read it. it took me some learning later until I learned, you know what? Maybe it's not all about me, which is a good perspective on life generally and prayer specifically. But maybe it's not about, maybe it's about me doing things for God. So I'm going to do something for Christ's sake. So I'll do whatever I want, and I'll say, did it for Jesus, home run for Jesus, touchdown for Jesus, right? Still not there yet. What he's saying is, you could do God's will if you learn it. That's what it's saying. Look at verse 11. Look at 4 verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have... Learned? You don't have to learn 
to be self-empowered. That naturally comes with selfishness. And you also have to learn to do whatever you want, and then at the end go, for Jesus. <laughs> that doesn't take much learning either. But you do have to learn if what you're supposed to be doing is what God wants done. And you have to learn what he's doing and what he's instructed to inform everything you do. Amen. That's a different thing. And so he says, I have learned, verse 11, in whatsoever state I am. This is, he tells you what he's learned. That whatever state I'm in, there were to be content. Wow. So I should not be discontent in any state. That's exactly what he said. Whatever state you're in, learn to be content. On what? Uh, how? Is it just a, a command based on the grace of God and what he's instructed in the epistles here? There's something you have to learn. It's a hard thing, folks. Whatever state you're in, to be content. He says in verse 12, For I know how to be abased, brought low. I know how to be abound, taken above. I, I know everywhere and in all things I am instructed by the Lord Jesus Christ, instructed both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need, and to be content. Yeah. Well, then what's the prayer request list? If, I mean, if the prayer request is all of our grievances and frustrations and sorrows and everything else, then what's that verse do to all that? Changes your perspective is what that does. There's still prayer requests, but it changes your perspective. Now you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because of the strength he provides for you to live a life that is filled with need, and yet God's provided everything that you need in Christ. Amen. You have to know the difference there. That's something you have to learn. We need to change our perspective. So we're under grace now. We're not under the law. We're not Israel in a covenant. We're not ignorant as Job or David was of Christ and what he revealed through the Apostle Paul. We can have access to all of that in the Scripture. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 the popular prayer promise from Paul is that God is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so if the choice is between you getting what you ask or God doing above all that you ask, the choice should be clear. Amen. I'll stick with, I don't know what to pray for. I'll try, but I'll pray. I don't know what to pray for. And God, you just, you just do, you do you. You do what's good and best for everybody. And by your grace, which we know is abundant because you've told us what you've done by your grace, you make it happen. And I'll just listen and learn and do, right? Ephesians 3, verse 20. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This is not you with the power of positive thinking or even the power of prayer. It's like, well, you can do it. Just pray it down. Nope. There's a power, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. You know, God dwells in you. Yeah. Instead of you dwelling in God's house, God's dwelling in yours. And not only that, he said, this house is mine now. Hmm. Wow. So I have nothing. That's right, you have nothing. And yet in Christ you have everything because you have glory and you have heaven and you have salvation and all the rest because Christ dwells in you by virtue of him dwelling in you. So God's able to do it above all as you ask. David said, save me. And what David meant was from his enemies immediately. What did God do? Saves humanity from the enemies forever. Amen. Right, that's what he does. David prayed for forgiveness. Christians in 1 John 1, 9 used that as the... As a forgiveness verse, forgive me for the sins that I committed. And what's God do? Forgives you all your trespasses. Like forgiving piecemeal is different than forgiving all your trespasses. Right? What if God has given us more than we know to ask him? That's the reality. While you were yet a sinner, God committed his love toward you. How do we know God loves us? He doesn't answer any of our prayers. God committed his love toward you that while you were yet a sinner, he died for you already. He rose from the dead to offer you salvation, to give you grace already before you even had heard the gospel and while you were a sinner, which means he died for people whom he knew would reject and sin against him so that they might be saved. That's the love of God committed toward you. He doesn't commit his love toward you in only giving you something when you love him first. That's not what happened. Grace is him doing it when you didn't deserve it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, Paul says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That's something that can only be prayed when you understand the gift, right? If you don't know what God has given, then you're asking. Obviously, that's what you should do, right? God, I, I need some help. But if you know what God's given, the, the response from you to God for what he's given should be thanks to God for his unspeakable gift because you appreciate so much what he's done. In Ephesians 3, verse 8, Paul talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians 3, verse 8. This is where the mystery has been revealed. And he says, unto me whom less than least of all saints is this grace given. Grace was given to Paul. That's something to be thankful for. 
You know, you have nothing to be thankful for unless something's been given to you. Yeah. Right? Romans 1, God created the world. So you have that. He's the creator. You have life. You have that. But now you have more. You have eternal life. You have the scripture. You have all the blessings he's given to you thereby. And Ephesians 3, verse 80 says that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The more that is preached and the more that is heard and understood, the more you have to give thanks to God for, which is why God's will is in everything, give thanks. If that was told to Job, it'd be very confusing. If God comes to Job, takes away all of his material things and all his family, and then says, in everything, give thanks. You'd say, what kind of malicious God, what? I'm not going to thank you for like evil, right? But he didn't say that to Job, right? He simply told Job, I'm the creator and you don't know half the story, which he didn't. But to you and I, who he has given life in all things, he says, in everything, give thanks through Christ Jesus. This is the will of God concerning you, right? So grace changes your perspective on prayer. He has given his abundant grace. He's given you his manifold wisdom. Ephesians 3, verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God has been known to you. So James 1, 6 says, you need wisdom, pray for it, and God will give it to you. What if he's given you his manifold wisdom? You want to know God's will? Pray for it, according to the prophets. What if God has made known the mystery of his will already? I don't need to pray for that either. I just need to learn it. Okay. Well, God saved me from my sins. What if he's already done that if you read the scripture and know the gospel? Oh, okay. Well, there's that one. But you'll find the most important things when your perspective has changed about what you really need from God have been addressed by Jesus Christ already. Prayer is your response to that. Asking to get things is very normal when you don't know what God's given. It's very normal when you are under a covenant, when God says, do this and you'll get. If you're not under a covenant and you know what God's given, then asking changes, okay? Under grace, we've been given so much freely in Christ, and that's why our prayers should be affected by it. That's why Paul in Philippians 4, verse 6, and I, I didn't emphasize it before, I will now. When he says, make your request made known to God, he says, with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. Before you ask God today, you should know what you've been given and have the perspective of thanking God for it before you ask. Sometimes that might halt your asking. Other times you might still have the ask, but at least you're doing it with thanksgiving. That's the requirement, Philippians 4 verse 7. Colossians 4 is the same thing. Pray with thanksgiving, then watch thereunto. You know, and it's God's will in this dispensation of grace. It's his will that you give thanks. So in your prayers... God's not saying, here's how you pray. Pray and I'll, to get, and I'll give you. He says, you pray to give me. What can you give God? Well, nothing, except for thanks and praise and glory for the grace received. And so that's a different kind of prayer. Right? Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. So where's your worries and frustrations and fears if God's not giving you the spirit of fear? Right? Who is sufficient when you pray for your inadequacy of living life, when God's giving you the Holy Spirit to help you walk after that spirit in this life. Who is sufficient? Well, God is sufficient. You're not, that's for sure. You learn by grace that you're not sufficient. God has to do it for you, right? And he's already shown how he's done it for you and doing it for you. And so you can praise God for his grace. We'll cover on Tuesday, Romans 8, 31, 32. Who can be against you if God be for you? If God's given you his own son, won't he freely give you all things? Right? This is grace. This is the position you're in right now. It's not the position David and Job was in. So if you struggle giving thanks, which is a proper response to God's freely given abundant grace in his gift, a good prayer might be, Lord, change my perspective. Help me learn how to pray. Learn what you've given. Right? Change my mind so that I can better appreciate what you've done for me, so I can acknowledge the good things that you've done. Because right? he's done more than just creation now. He's made you a new creature in Christ. And so that, that hopefully should change your prayer perspective quite a bit in under grace when you understand what God's done for you. Any thoughts or any comments? Yeah, Ray? Right.